All right. Um, good morning, class. Yeah, um, today we're going to look at financial services marketing as one of the courses that I'm taking. And uh, obviously, in addition to financial services, I teach other marketing courses. But for you, you're actually you know, doing the financial services. As you know, my name is Kobe, Kobe Mensah, uh, part of the marketing and customer management department of the University of Ghana Business School. Now, to start the session, um, or to start the entire, you know, uh, what you call course for the for the semester, and um, today we'll be looking at the setup of the financial services in Ghana. That is the introduction to financial services marketing, the Ghanaian context. What has happened in the market, you know, over the years? Obviously, you know, prior to 1992, when the country, you know, uh, was returned, you know, to multi-party democracy, you call it. Obviously, the industry had been dominated by quite a number of, you know, well, by some some few banks, not quite a number of, but some few banks, you know. Of course, the deregulation that actually followed since then, which is uh, 1994 onwards, which the government you know, took measures to deregulate you know, the Ghanaian market. And then subsequently we had the central bank also taking some steps to expand the Ghanaian financial sector. We have seen, especially from 2000, and five onwards, we've seen tremendous inflows of financial institutions in Ghana. I mean, or into Ghana, if I should say. We have seen the expansion of the, the banking sector, the expansion of the insurance sector. We have seen the, the emergence of the stock market. And these are remarkable kind of growth and they have expanded the service sector to become the leading you know, uh, sector in our economy. So that's the reason why it is imperative that we look at the financial services you know, in this country, because it looks like it's becoming the, 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 the crucial backbone, if you like, of Ghana's growth. So that's the importance of we looking at that. So, Let's look at it. We say the session overview, it is imperative that we understand how marketing environment influences current and future demand and supply of financial products and services in this country. Uh, as an outline, we're going to look at what are financial services, the financial services industry in Ghana, underpinnings of banking industry success in Ghana, segments of corporate banking customers, and then we'll look at the registered banks as of 2013 December that is the most outdated you know, kind of uh, record that we have from the central bank. Reading list, uh, you can, obviously as you see it, you can look at some of these you know, materials as your reading list to support you. Okay, so what are financial services? Well, financial services are any service or product of a financial nature that is traded in financial markets. So it can be classed, uh, classified as, example, do they have a fixed or variable interest rate? How long do they take to mature? Are they offered by a deposit taking or non-deposit taking intermediary? Financial services cover an extensive range of instruments, example, in consumer marketplace, on equity release schemes, and a long-term car. The marketplace for financial services is extensive we said a global marketplace, wide range of customers, example, retail consumers, business corporate customers, other financial institutions. And the key activity of financial institutions is intermediation. Now, when we say intermediation, we mean financial services actually aggregate you know, deposits from those who have and you know, onward lend it to those who need. So the point of kind of a, a repository or a depository, if you put it, 
where they 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 sort of make sure that they look for buyers of money i.e so if you have your money you deposit and they look for people who need loans and they would onward forward it now the role is crucial because for example if you have to actually look for people to buy your money so to speak obviously look at the effort and look at how successful are you going to be to retrieving back your money not to even talk about getting people to pay you interest and everything so i think their role is very crucial as a center a central point where they can aggregate resources and onward you know push it to people who need it at a profit so the profit is actually shared between obviously themselves and those who actually deposit their money to them so that's why we say that it's an intermediary role they play an intermediary role between the buyer and the seller of money and of course of other resources all right so uh, which means that they create assets for savers and liabilities for borrowers which are more attractive to each other than would be the case if the parties had to deal with each other directly like i explained all right so what are financial services examples we can see you know examples of financial services you know retail corporate investment mutual funds personal and group pensions specialist lending companies stock exchanges now in this country uh, we traditionally have susu in the collectors where people go around homes offices marketplaces and then people sort of put in their money every week or every day and at the end of the month you know you sign off how much have you got and if you have aggregated quite a lot and you want to use it for something meaningful you go for it so it was it had been with us you know uh, for a long time and then we had the emergence of you know so to speak conventional you know methods of banking or financial services and then we have the savings and loans we have get funds you know all part of the uh, financial services in this country so if you look at this uh, kind of a demonstration of the financial services sector in this country you have major banks predominantly as we know we know Stanchard Barclays you know Ghana Commercial Bank now GCB is no longer Ghana Commercial Bank and then from then we had the emergence of some new banks like Echo Bank you know uh, what do you call um, Access Bank uh, Zenit Bank which are new generation of banks you know we have fidelity bank and other things so yeah you have the major banks here and then you have the insurance company so industry the industry is predominantly dominated by the major banks and then the next big thing is about the insurance industry quite a number of them you know and then m much more recent ones as well i mean the traditional ones you have enterprise insurance you know as one of the traditional banks in this country obviously you have glyco you have the, the national insurance which is uh, sic is no longer state insurance but is sic now you know uh, you have uh, others like uh, metropolitan insurance you have uh, quite a number of them in the system at the moment and quite new ones as well now you have the rural and community banks again they've been with us for quite some time now and again as a part of the deregulations of the Ghanaian industry or Ghanaian economy you have quite a number of uh, what you call uh, um, rural banks but I think the rural banking was an attempt to encourage financial inclusion because obviously if you have these major banks only dotted around city centers and urban areas then you're actually excluding technically and the privileged especially those who find themselves in villages of course they also need financial services so it was a good thing that the government sought advice to sort of uh, encourage the establishment of rural banks and community banks so that these people who find themselves not in the cities could also participate in the financial market and that has really served the country well because it had actually helped you know many people in diverse ways and it had helped the country to expand 
in many sectors, especially when it comes to agriculture. That is where most of these banks actually serve in agricultural dominated the communities, fishing communities, and most underprivileged communities. So, so that's a, an impressive development in, a, in this country. Now, fast forward, and then we have the astronomical entry of microfinancing that has been amazing. Because in the, next, in the last uh, five, six years, or within the last 10 years, you have seen an increasing rise of what we call microfinance, you know, which is awesome. And I think the microfinance predominantly had been centered in, in you know, urban areas to take care of, you know, the urban areas also have underprivileges, you know, and they have really done well going down to take care of them. Of course, some of them are in the rural areas, but the uh, what we call the rural banks and the community bank take care of the rural areas. But then, when it comes to the urban areas, not every urban dwellings are actually, you know, privileged. So many, you know, ghettos, so many underprivileged you know, settlements within the urban centers. And you have so many people who also require financial services but cannot get it from the major banks, you know. And because of their location in urban areas, you know, they can't get it from the rural banks or community banks. So therefore, the entry of microfinance makes sense. And again, it's a question of inclusion. Because if somebody, the mere fact that the person lives in Accra doesn't mean that they can get access to major banks. Because of the economic situation, there could be a lower tier in terms of the economic status. And they need financial services. So, it's part of the inclusion agenda to make sure that people can actually have access to financial services and to expand their businesses and to grow their ambitions, you know, and to be to to sort of alleviate to alleviate uh, what we call uh, um, poverty. So I think that's a major, you know, uh, contribution to the Ghanaian economy, especially to the financial sector, and they have they like ubiquitous. You can find them almost every corner. My concern, however, is about, yes, I know the central bank is highly regulated in this industry, but I think that we have to also be much more careful in terms of the growth of this particular industry so that people are not being taken advantage of or people are not being unduly you know, uh, pushed for microfinance loans you know, and then pushed for uh, or to pay exorbitant interest rate because these markets are not as as uh, what you call watched after as the central i mean as the major banks so i think we have to be very careful in terms of yes it is a good thing that we're encouraging financial inclusion but we also have to watch it about possible bubble and how this industry is actually growing you know what are we doing to make sure that we can check and scrupulous people taking advantage of, you know, underprivileged. We are in this country, and we know the story about uh, some two institutions some time ago, uh, trying to recollect their names, uh, Piram, for example. Piram and the other one, I've forgotten the name, took advantage and duped quite a lot of people in this country. And most people lost their lives because of that. We must ensure that Piram doesn't happen again. And I think that's where we have to be watchful in terms of you know, regulations and others going forward. Then we have the capital market. Obviously, we've talked about, you know, the, the, I've talked about the stock exchange and the growth of the stock exchange in this country. Crucial, but amongst these sectors, amongst these you know, uh, categories in financial services, I think it is the least known we haven't been able to push the capital market to the level that could make it you know, a backbone. But it is crucial because if you look at the growth of uh, what we call um, cities like London, cities like New York, they, they have extensively made use of the capital market. And that is what's driving a lot of industries you know, in these countries, in the developed world 
And I think that it is crucial that in Ghana, we make sure we can push the capital market to a status where it could be one of our backbones to the economy. And then, of course, the rest. You know, the rest could be some uh, credit unions. We have credit unions. We have church, you know, churches that actually do some of these, you know, uh, uh, cooperative type of arrangement to help and the privilege or to help even themselves. You know, we have so many other financial arrangements, you know, within the, the sector. So uh, the financial services industry in Ghana, we say financial finance house, uh, registered financial institutions, non-bank and u universal as of December 2013, well, finance house 25, credit reference bureau 3, savings and loans 24, leasing companies 2, finance and leasing company 3, mortgage finance 1, total non-bank financial institutions equals 58. So we have 58 non-bank non financial institutions in this country as of 2013, and we have 31 total universal banks. When we say universal banks, banks that have been licensed to trade in you know, financial services. And then of course, those that have not been licensed to the universal banks, but to do you know, other savings and loans or microfinance and other things, yeah. So that's the statistics as we have them you know, from the central bank as of December 2013. Now, obviously, we've got to check the new update, but there hadn't been any update as of now. Now, underpinnings of banking industry success in Ghana. I have said that the deregulation policies have actually contributed to the total expansion of the Ghanaian economy. Obviously, telecommunication, a boom. You know, we now have financial services, a boom. And we have other, you know, sectors that have actually seen an increasing rise especially media, for example, since the deregulation, fantastic you know, growth in the media industry. You have TV channels and countless, we can't count them. We have radio stations, newspapers, magazines. The industry is just expanded, and so is the financial services. So we have witnessed a significant growth in 2012, which could be attributed to pressures on the banks to show significant returns from investment made by shareholders. And then we have in Ghana, it is estimated that about 90% of companies registered are microfinance, small and medium enterprises. They have evolved to become key suppliers and services providers to large corporations, including multinational and transnational corporations. About 49% of Ghana's GDP in 2012 was generated from SMEs, and they therefore have an impact on economic growth, income, and employment. The economy of Ghana was projected to grow by 8% in 2013 and 8.7% you know, in 2014. One of the key indicators of a booming economy is a vibrant small and medium enterprises in a sub economy and how well they contribute to GDP. So we can see, I mean, the growth of the SMEs means they need money. They need some sort of financial services to, to actually operate and to grow. And then at the same time, they contribute money. You know, they serve as a, a source for aggregating, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, money to, to sell to other people. So we're saying that having almost about 90% of companies registered be macro, small, and medium enterprises is a plus. And that is actually fueling the financial sector. Because mind you, if it's about multinationals and international firms, clearly they have the capacity to source funds abroad. Now, micro and small scale industries and uh, medium sized industries do not have the capacity to source funds abroad. And so they are likely or they're most, much more likely to source funds within the country. And as a result, fuel the financial sector or the financial services sector. And then again, they will contribute in terms of, you know, aggregating money. So that is where, you know, the growth of this industry is actually coming from. And that is according to PwC Banking Survey in 2013. Again, in Ghana, the bulk of SMEs are within the service sector, particularly hotels, restaurants, transport and storage business, and real estate. The service sector contributed 49.3 to GDP in 2012, having grown at an annual rate of 8.8% 8 .8 over 
over its 2011 contribution. 2013 banking survey insight into what could be done to achieve better financial inclusion of SMEs were gathered. Without a doubt, banks to recognize SMEs as, as, as very good contributors to their own businesses, still banks engage with SMEs trading rather very cautiously because of the higher than average risks SMEs carry. Now, it's also crucial for us to you know, take note of this particular point because, you see, when it comes to financials, uh, there's a high risk because loan delinquencies and things could be on the rise if people are not, you know, kind of uh, being successful in their businesses. And you know, the SMEs usually haven't got tight tipped uh, or tight roped, you know, uh, kind of structure in terms of, you know, governance, corporate governance as big businesses have. And so therefore, they're sort of seen as a high risks, you know, in financial sector. Because if you have very good, um, let's say, corporate governance structure, you know, then of course, you know, the, 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 the confidence in it is much more higher than institutions that, that, that don't have such structures available. So banks actually see SMEs, though, as crucial part, a partner in growth, but also they see them as high risks because most of the time it's one man, you know, proprietorship, for example, few people proprietorship, for example. If there's a delinquency, what happens? And majority of them may not have the muscle in terms of assets, you know, that could defray some of these, you know, costs or some of these borrowings. As a result, they're actually seen as high risk and p banks actually trade cautiously in making sure that, you know, they, they do due diligence, you know, in business. So, again, the causative factors for SME's high risk profiles are very well known and have been very well documented. Knowledge of awareness or awareness of these risks has not by itself led to increased financial inclusion for SMEs. The fact remains that SMEs remain in competition with larger and better organized corporate customers and government too. Of course, you know, they're not in the market alone and they've got to compete with the Barclays and all those big giants in the market. You know, those who that work in maybe the good sector, of course, if you're a small SME producing drinks, you're working with Coca-Cola. I mean, in competition with Coca-Cola and other, you know, Accra Brewery or Kumasi Brewery and all those, you know, uh, you know, companies, giants. So the risk factor is, is very real in terms of, you know, financial services and things like that. All right. So with the existence of such high demand from alternative customers that also have more acceptable risk profiles, banks generally seem to have avoided investment, investing themselves. There must be transformational change to harness the SME's potential and to ensure increased financial inclusion for SMEs for the missing medal. Yeah, let me talk about a missing medal. Now, from the PwC's study, there's an assumption that in as much as the growth has been happening at the lower level, which is the microfinance, you know, the growth of the microfinance and the access to financial services by small businesses, small, you know, owner business, let's say, uh, sole proprietorship, market domain, and all this having access to microfinance. And then, of course, the top boys, you know, the big businesses having access to, you know, what they call this, uh, the, the, the major banks. Now, there's a frustration at the middle. People who own small businesses, not as small as the microfinance level, but let's say medium scale businesses, actually finding it increasingly difficult to assess funding or to assess financial services because the top banks are looking at government projects, are looking at the big businesses, big tickets, businesses they call it, big tickets, you know, kind of uh, 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 contracts. And so they give to the contractors, they give to, you know, mining firms, they give to oil. And then the macro level, or the, uh, what do you call, the savings and loans, are also concentrating on the small businesses. What happens to people who own middle level businesses or middle scale you know businesses? They are being overlooked. And in the PWCs in a report they call it the missing middle because they're increasingly getting frustrated that the attention has shifted to the micro level. And of course, 
they had always been at the top level, but then where did they fit? And that's a concern. The, this is a graphical representation of what the PWC reports talk about the, the missing middle. And you can see that obviously there's a huge concentration of, of micro enterprises at the bottom, uh, 65 to 75% being taken care of by the microfinance institutions. That's a tremendous you know, kind of figure you can see that, I mean, percentage, you can see that. Then you have the, the medium, the top, you know, the top ticket, like I said, uh, the top 0.1% and then the you know, 0.9% being taken care of by the corporate and multinational enterprises, you know, or, or they, they're made up of the multinational, corporate and multinational enterprises, large enterprises, and they're being taken care of by the uh, the, 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 what do you call, the, the major banks, that's the bank's primary target, that's the major banks, are taking care of the top 1%. And then you have the middle here. The middle here you have the medium enterprises, which is 5 to 10%, and then 20% here. That's the problem. That's why we're talking about the missing middle, because you have the medium enterprises and the medium, well, here, supposed to be taken care of by someone you know but we're saying that these major banks are actually concentrating on the top one percent government you know project contract you know uh, what we call construction industry the oil the extractive industries they they are concentrated on here because they're big tickets and they get more money you know concentrating on here and then these ones are actually taking care of the micro enterprises, which is the microfinance taking care of the micro enterprises. What about here? And that's what the PwC's, you know, banking survey in 2013 talks about. That there is an increasing frustration at the middle that they cannot access reasonable financial services to sort of uh, encourage growth. And that is what you know they're talking about. How do we, you know? as strategy going forward, how do financial institutions, banks, for example, try to create portfolio of product to take care of these ones? You know, clearly, the microfinance can't do these ones because they have a mandate to serve some people and they can't punch above their weight because they don't have the resources, they don't have the, you know, the muscle. And if they have, what it is is that the central bank has policies, regulations in place that prevents them from doing some of these, you know, big tickets, you know, so they can't, by their nature and their setup, they cannot actually take care of here. It's only these big boys who can do that, but also they are preoccupied with central bank, you know, uh, or they are preoccupied with central government project, they are preoccupied with multinational corporations, you know, and therefore they're not concentrating on this middle. How do we actually you know, sort of either by policy or by, you know, share company strategy, come to the aid of these people, you know. All right, so an interesting point that emerged from the PwC survey is the fact that 20, 82% of banks interviewed stated that SMEs contribute between 5 and 25% of the annual operating income. That's tremendous. A similarly interesting result from their survey is that 91% of participating banks reported that 5% to 50% of their gross loan book was in the form of SME loans. 55 of these of this group reported that SME credit facilities constituted 5 to 25% of their gross loan book value. The above statistics are indicative of both the significant economic and commercial potential that lies with the SME sector, as well as the high cost burden that the banking industry imposes on this promising economic growth. Key changes, um, key changes that occurred in the industry were takeovers, acquisitions, and I think we have been, you know, uh, witnesses to these. You know, over the years we have seen uh, takeovers and acquisitions. You know, uh, we have seen measures, you know, going forward, I think we're going to witness quite a lot of them because the sector is becoming very, very competitive. Obviously, the TTB Eco Bank, you know, uh, kind of is a takeover, 
you know, Ecobank took over TTB, Access Bank Intercontinental Bank, and then First Atlantic Merchant Bank Limited, acquired by Cadore Group. And then we have quite a number of rebranding taking place. I talked about Ghana Commercial Bank rebranded to GCB, and we have uh, what we call First Atlantic Bank being rebranded as First Atlantic Bank. Uh, it used to be First Atlantic Merchant Bank. And then we have BSIC uh, that changed the colors from green to blue. We have SGSSB being changed to Societe General. And we have our Greek Development Bank being changed to ADB with a different kind of logo and a different kind of feel. So we've seen quite a number of changes in the industry. Of course, we also know of Universal Merchant Bank, which is the old Merchant Bank now being changed to Universal Merchant Bank. We have Cal Merchant Bank, it used to be Cal, now it's only Cal, it's no longer Cal Merchant Bank. And then we have the new entrant, like Royal Bank, and other you know uh, kind of new entrants. We also saw the transitioning of uh, savings and loans to a universal bank, which is First Capital Plus, with an amazing story. Within three years, a bank can metamorphose from savings and loans to a universal bank. That is tremendous, you know. So, and we we actually witnessing quite a number of them. GN Bank, I think, also used to be. A savings and loans with a different name now being given Universal Bank to uh, to operate as GN Bank. So there are quite a lot of changes that is happening in this industry. What it means is that there's a lot of competition. Access to cash or access to financial services has become a commonplace. But also what has become commonplace is about quality of service. All right. Now, we used to have a terrible quality of service in the past. It's changed because the competition is tough. When competition is tough, you've got to find out how do you differentiate yourself from your competitor. And differentiation comes in many ways. But key is about your customer services. So the game has been upped, but we can see quite a number of, also quite a number of firms that are slacking in the industry. You know, people are not you know punching as they should do so in as much as we have witnessed you know tremendous growth in the sector witnessed quality of service you know uh, uh, enhanced we also are saying that it is not enough what is happening perhaps consumers are not demanding as much and i think that there must be certain frameworks like consumer rights organizations have to come along with this growth because as the industry is growing, you're looking at not only the regulatory framework, but you're looking at the activism part of it. Do we have consumer rights groups emerging in order that they can help and support consumers in demanding what is right for them? Because once these companies are growing, they become too big, too big, too powerful, and it makes it difficult for individual consumer like yourself to, what, to battle them if they don't give you better service. So I think what is crucial, what is lacking at the moment, is the growth of consumer rights activism you know, to, to, to powerfully you know, grow along these, these lines that could insist on consumers' rights and insist on good quality services. And I think that's what we're lacking now as a country. So yes, the regulators are there, the industry is growing. What about activism? You know, yes policies have been initiated to enforce you know, financial inclusion, but that's not enough. Financial inclusion is not only the problem, but there are other problems like quality of service, you know, and individuals cannot fight it alone. So we need to look at that aspect and see how best we can help to have a total growth of the sector. So registered banks, as of December, like we said, are these the list, as you can see. Mentioned quite a lot, of, uh, a number of them. Uh, ABG Access Bank, ADB, uh, Baroda Bank of Baroda, uh, BBGL Barclays Bank, uh, Bank of Africa. Uh, obviously, you have the Central Bank. Um, you have uh, Sahel Sahara Bank, Cal Bank, Eco Bank, Energy Bank, First Atlantic Bank, Fidelity Bank, First Capital Plus, GCB Limited, that's the formerly Ghana Commercial Bank. Go on to your trust bank, GT Bank, you have HFC Bank, and quite a number 
of the banks as well. Let's see, yeah, the list goes on. Now, obviously, recently we have the rebranding of International Commercial Bank to First Bank, you know, because it's been acquired. Now, let me say something about acquisitions and measures, measures and acquisition. Again, there seems to be a problem where we're seeing these measures and acquisitions, you know, happening, but we're not seeing um, uh, what, call, what, we, what we are actually witnessing is problems in these acquisitions because it looks like most of the acquisitions have actually concentrated on the finance aspect, i.e. Uh, efficiencies and making sure that you integrate the operations of these banks in order that you can make pro more profit or you can you know, actually be profitable going forward. What we haven't seen is a proper inclusion of marketing concept or of, of branding in, in these acquisitions. So we have heard of issues happening in banks where the acquired bank, the staff of the acquired bank and, the, and then the bank that did the acquisition are not really on good terms. Why? Because the acquired bank staff feel aggrieved and they feel a little bit, I don't know how to put, like as if they failed, so to speak, and as a result leading to the acquisition. I think that what is crucial is about how do you manage the internal processes to have a seamless you know, kind of integration where the staff will feel as part of the business as the original staff of the bank that did the acquisition. So I think that there had been, uh, yes, these acquisitions have been successful maybe from financial perspective or from finance perspective. But when it comes to marketing and branding, I think most of these firms have failed in the integration process. And I think that is where we may have to look at going forward to advise these institutions or to advise some of your, you know, uh, what do you call those of you who are in you know, influential positions or those of you who are aiming to move up the rank once you finish this particular course, is to take to the table the issues about, you know, internal marketing, the issues about branding, the issues about uh, what do you call uh, 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 organizational culture, you know. If you're integrating two entities, they have two different set of organizational culture. How do you make sure that you take them along the line or you take them along the line of the integration, make sure that you get them buying, you get your buying from them and make sure that they feel part of the process. Because if the internal customers, i.e. the workers and everything else, are not satisfied, it has an impact on the, what, on the consumers or on the, on the customers outside. So it is crucial that you let people feel part of it. You just don't go and absorb them. I have, uh, there's a case study about one of these banks that is acquisition, and they literally locked up or locked out the acquired you know, bank's staff, saying that they won't let them in. That's shameful. And that is entirely not acceptable. You know, uh, I don't think it's even acceptable from legal perspectives, but again, it's not acceptable in corporate world because it's the same stuff you're gonna use. So if you lock them up now, <laughs> and then you open up later on, how do you expect them to feel? Are they second citizens to the business? I think these are some of the crucial things that we may start addressing, or we have to start addressing actually, in some of these acquisitions and major you know, processes, and they are crucial to the success of the, the entire you know, exercise. So that's where we're gonna actually you know, draw the curtain on the introduction of you know, financial services looking at the country contest, the Ghanaian contest. And I think that you, know, uh, you, you, you may take a word or two or you, know, you may take some, some few lessons from that. I think I'll leave, I will stop now here and then you know, listen to some of your questions and your contributions. You gave an instance of uh, acquisitions and the aftermath that is not good in terms of how the acquired bank staff are uh, incorporated into the activities. I just want to know the activities that the acquiring bank should do in order to incorporate the, the acquired bank staff into the, the activities. Well, that's a very good question. When you are starting a process like acquisitions, it's a, a very long process, a very detailed process, and it's always at the strategic level, which means that 
the top executives are discussing the books, discussing operational issues and things. But crucially, what you want to do is to also start using the corporate int intranet to initiate the discussion you know, within the two businesses, the two firms. So you put it out there on the intranet to say that, well, we are beginning a process and we're looking at a partnership or we're looking at some sort of collaboration because sometimes firms are a little bit, you know, uh, secretive when it comes to acquisitions because of a whole lot of things that kind of comes with it, like strikes, some, you know, the acquired business may not want to do, so staff may want to go on strike. So there are quite a lot of things that actually prevent them from coming out openly. But you can actually start saying you are trying to start some, you know, collaboration, you know, sort of arrangement. So how do people want to see it going forward? You can ask people the opinions, you know, of a possibility of working together with another firm. Now, having gone with the internet, you can also start having some meetings, you know, uh, meeting maybe the leadership of the, the workers' union, asking the opinions and seeing how best you can for, uh, go forward with this. Now, mind you, the bottom line is, can you speak to them that it is in their best interest going forward? and they're going to get the best deal, you know, than what they're getting now. I mean, the question is, what is the net for them? And if you have to have that good plan, if you have to have that good package, if you have to have that assurances that what is going to happen wouldn't be to their detriment, but it will be to their benefit and the benefit of society, I don't think that any reasonable person would stand against it. So it is about a process of communicating, you know, the, the process and letting people see the benefits in it for them and saying that it would enhance their career, it would enhance their life, it would better their lives. And it will make the two businesses better together. You know, once you initiate some of these conversations and some of these meetings, soliciting for ideas and what, you know, they think going forward must be done, they feel part of the process. You know, and they don't feel that they are external to the process. But it is about shoving down the, the truth and saying yes, whether you like it or yes, or you like it or not, this is the thing. It won't work. The top-down approach won't work. So you've got to find a way to talk to them, find a way to solicit their ideas, find a way to let them feel part of the process going forward, and then find a way to communicate to them the benefits that they stand to gain should the process go forward. That's the only way that you can ensure that you have a harmonious, seamless, you know, kind of integration. Okay, and look, uh, my second question is, in the lecture you gave an instance of banks that have rebranded, including GCB. What I know is rebranding should lead towards creating a certain level of newness. Mm -hmm. But what I see with GCB is that they, they, there seem to be several inconsistency issues. For example, they have a logo, mm. which is yellow and white. The head, that's the head of the, of the eagle, uh, a yellow eagle with a white head. You go to a different branch, and the head is black. Again, most of the ATMs have the, 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 the former eagle, which is black, over there. Mm. And so, I mean, there, there, there seems to be inconsistency, and the customer who is not privy to the fact that they have rebranded will just assume that GCB is still GCB. Mm. And again, in terms of communication, They've not done enough on telly, on radio. Uh, I, 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 I don't think they have done enough in communicating their, their, their rebranding mm -hmm. approach. Well, uh, that is true. I mean, this is part of the new jerk kind of uh, decisions that corporates, you know, uh, or people in strategic positions sometimes, you know, take. I mean, people become so enthusiastic about, oh, yeah, let's rebrand. And then quickly they put it in the operation without thinking through the processes and how to achieve them, you know. So if you actually rebrand it like you're saying, and you're going to have part of your, you know, eagle's head white and another breath you have eagle's head black, obviously that is inconsistent. And that would actually say to people that you are the same. You haven't changed. 
Because rebranding is supposed to show that you have changed in character. And the change in character is for the better. Now, if part of your officers is saying black, others, it means that you don't have attention to detail. It means that you are actually approaching, you're doing things exactly as it used to be that customers were not happy about. So that is hugely a representation of how incompetent and of how inefficient your brand is and you carried it forward to the new 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 regime because rebrand is supposed to be a new regime and then again when it comes to rebrand it's not only about the aesthetics that you actually change it but you are talking about corporate culture you know are your people changing their ways their behaviors of seven is customer services having a new character you know are you responding to customers needs in a very rapid manner as a new you know brand if you don't do this again you're failing so you're actually failing even though we haven't actually had enough time since they rebranded or they are rebranding for us to assess the effectiveness of it clearly you can see that they are failing from the beginning because you haven't actually shown the attention to detail that a new brand is supposed to actually have and then again let's talk about the same issue as the measures and acquisitions how do you carry the internal you know uh, customers along you know to what extent did you sensitize the internal customers i.e the workers and then the suppliers and everybody else that you actually you know work with how do you went along to sensitize them you know about this rebranding exercise how do you inculcate it or how did you seek the opinions and inculcated these opinions into the entire process so that they feel part of the exercise and they can deliver because they say oh, we took the decision we're part of this decision making we must be part of it working now if you don't do this you are failing and that's exactly what most of these companies have done i think i was fantastically you know excited about the adb rebranding i think spot on they almost covered everything you know, as to whether the internal staff are actually, you know, uh, what do you call, exhibiting or showing the new character of ADB, having been, you know, uh, private to that because I haven't actually been to ADB to, 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 to actually, you know, transact business or haven't done any study on it. But I think that they fantastically, you know, rolled out their new brand, which cultivated, I, I think it's captivated a lot of people's imagination and people were talking about, oh, and the new brand actually looks nice. I mean, the, the logo looks fantastically refreshed. You know, it doesn't look like a tired ADB brand any longer. It looks very, very refreshed. You can't say the same with a GCB, I'm afraid. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to add uh, something more to um, exactly what he said. But the thing is that, like, I, I, um, look, I feel that oftentimes in Ghana here, um, we the consumers or uh, we being the customers don't demand much from the banks at all. It's like okay, if I'm to if I'm to put my money there and I'm getting this X amount of money out of it, like I can I can save money there and I'm doing okay. I don't really need to demand much from the banks. So then, if, even though in as much as we are putting much pressure on the banks and about their um, burning culture and how they do business, I feel that like it's also up also for. Um, um, advocacy groups in the country also to um, I, I let educate also like uh, mm. with the customers and uh, consumers about what we um, uh, stand to gain from mm. this relationship mm. we have we have with the uh, um, uh, with the um, banks also because if I don't know if for a long time this is what I'm used to they giving me if I go to bank A bank B bank C this is what they give me. I'm, I don't know what I'm entitled to in it. That's right. Entitled. So then I feel that it's also apt for like um, regulatory groups or like um, uh, people that have been assigned to um, check these banks on exactly uh, mm. what, uh, what they do to tell we what we are entitled Supposed to. to. Yeah. Then we will know which, what we will do. Because I mean, if for, for like a long time, um, Ghana Commercial Bank giving like, um, for instance, I know that if I'm going there, it's a long queue. Since I 
I I I know for my grandmoms they they all say they're like oh for them good it's a, oh it's a long queue so oh it's it's normal you know it's right. it's it's how they work it's 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 normal it's, it's yeah. easier so then I feel like if we are we are, we know exactly what intent to yeah I mean um that is just by the way okay um back to my question dog um um what I like to ask of you is that if um from the um, lecture that you gave we realize that in the finance sector or in the finance industry uh, those that are the um, top dogs are basically uh corporate banks they are at the top but i think close to last but one in the chain is uh capital market mm-hmm. but if you watch about almost all the big countries that have made it to the mm-hmm. top mm-hmm. what really sustains their economy or their industries is the capital market mm-hmm. and if you and if you look at the um the top dogs also the corporate banks realize that they are really doing a good job because the missing middle mm-hmm. is okay i am an uh, I, I i get helped i start a company small then i get helped by this susu or like this small banks rural banks gave me then i'm able to boost myself up then i jump up to the middle I can't jump up just from the small to the bigger. I have to go through the middle. But then I realize that if I get to the middle and I want help, I don't get help. Mm-hmm. So then it's like those are coming in with other like um, uh, huge money from outside the country, right? So I realize that oftentimes in Ghana here, most of the um, huge companies that are making much more of the money get their money not from the country. Actually, yeah, they get it from outside the country because at least they are coming from very good in, in uh, mm-hmm. countries coming here. Basically, my question that I'll let you ask is that um, obviously it's not helping, but then so what can we do to help mm. raise the capital market? Because like I, I, that is that is only way mm. proven to help grow yeah. the industries. Yeah, say. yeah, I okay. think you're right. Let me first of all take the the question about we not knowing what what is right for us or what we must demand. And the, the, the question about we or they have taken the consumers for granted and we have accepted it as the norm. You know, and, and that's what I was saying that advocacy has to be a keyword, you know. And I think that the central bank, in as much as they have the role to regulate, they also have a role to, to, to push on or to, to sponsor uh, advocacy, you know, programs because. You see, it is only through advocacy that consumers would know what is right or what is in their right to demand, you know. And elsewhere, you have central banks having, you know, come out with uh, certain frameworks, certain institutions that are responsible for taking consumers' queries and taking action. So, for example, you can have the central bank, the BOG, having an arm that is there, and all that they do is they they tell people, they, they, they broadcast or they advertise, you know, that if you have received certain shoddy services, write to us. You know, if you have received certain, you know, services that are not pleasing, that you find very absurd, write to us, you know. And then they will take measures to resolve some of these issues. They serve as an intermediary between the consumers and then the, the, the provider, service provider. So the service provider knows that this, this, this arm of the central bank will be pushing, and then they will be what? They will be uh, charged. You know, they will be asked to pay a, a certain, certain amount of money for shoddy services. Now, if the central bank can be doing that, clearly you can have consumers that are enlightened, consumers that, are, that actually know their rights, and know where to write to, where to complain. But the central bank is not doing that. It's only concentrating on regulation and not concentrating on pushing for you know, better services because if you're looking for competition and better services, it's about whether the consumers know they're right and would demand for it. So the central bank, I think, is you know, not taking you know, seriously the other aspect of what it must be doing. And I think also that uh, for years, we haven't actually had the third sector that looks into consumer rights. And I think uh, I know that there's one uh, gentleman that has been, uh, Kofi Capito, that has been actually talking about consumer rights and things. But we need so many of Kofi Capitos 
you know, we need so many of these people to push for consumer, you know, uh, 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 for service quality and consumer rights. And once we start having that, people would know what is due them and they would demand what is due them and companies will set up. But at the moment, they're not setting up. You know, that's one thing, one challenge that we need to, you know, we, we, need, to, we need to resolve. Coming back to what should we do, I mean, yes, the capital market is the backbone of London. You know, that's where companies source their money of New York capital market. In our case, again, we have failed to make the capital market ubiquitous, just like we have done, uh, 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 as we have done with the microfinance. How do we create the awareness? I think that earlier on, uh, and uh, if I'm not right, if I'm not wrong, early 2000s, shares and talk about shares and stocks was predominant. You know, they started pushing, and I think that's when we started trying to grow the stock market, the Ghana Stock Exchange. There was so much noise about shares, and people started buying. But I think that the interest went when people realized that. You know, because people thought that once you buy a share, you a month you would expect some big money put into your account. You understand? People had the misconception of thinking that the share was like a lottery. You put five thousand, and the following month you have like fifteen thousand, twenty thousand, and when those things were not there, you know, they 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 thought that they they felt disappointed, and and people said, but you see, they should have been told that it's a security. You know, not necessarily giving you X billions of money, but of course, if the company makes money, you get more money, you know, and then it's also part of you as an investment worth, you know, doing. We didn't actually sustain the awareness. And I think the education was misplaced, you know, because they were giving people too much of ambitious, you know, targets, like you put in money, you get this and all that, you know. So that is where the problem, you know, uh, came from. People interest waned because they were not getting the money that they thought they would be getting and they didn't understand well how to trade you know and as to where where to do the trading you know the brokers and things also took advantage of people and so there were quite a lot of issues you know with that particular sector i think it is right to say that the sector has to rebrand and typically if you look at the insurance industry they've come a long way the insurance industry also had a bad image like that. In Ghana, it was insurance was like, oh, don't bother going there. I mean, if you get your car scratched or if you get an accident, you rather want to think about it between you and the person. How do you fix it? Never go to insurance. But I think regulation had played a role to make sure that the industry, you know, becomes you know uh, irrelevant. And I think that for fear that police are going to stop you, the police is going to stop you, would make people buy insurance. And the other insurance services or the other insurance products are not doing that well, like content insurance and things are not doing well. Which means that whenever there is enforcement of some sort, people's behavior would sort of change. So how do we inculcate that thought and make sure that content insurance, for example, life insurance and other insurance packages you know, or product will be relevant to people or people will see them as relevant and will be lucrative in a business? How do we ensure that we can rebrand the stock market or rebrand the capital market and make it look relevant to our industry? Let people understand that if we can push towards, obviously they say we're in middle income, but if we can push toward the kind of development you know, vision that we have, we rather want to push the stock market where people can tap into you know, monies as capital to do their business. And if we can get the understanding right, I think that we can go somewhere. Okay, so yeah, thanks for the questions. And I think that you have, uh, I'm sure that I've been able to kind of discuss the issues in a way that you understand it, in a way that you can apply it in your various uh, working places. And I'm sure you can bring some of these issues that we've discussed to the doorsteps or to the notices of your respective authorities that some of these things are, some of the things are plaguing the industry or things that we can do right to make sure that the financial services sector will grow and will become, you know, maybe an excellent benchmark for other sectors to look at. So the next session, uh, we'll look at the challenges 
the challenges of marketing financial services, you know, uh, because obviously uh, financial services are not something that naturally, you know, people would like to go out of their way to acquire them. So we'll look at the challenges in that and how you can successfully turn these challenges to opportunities in, in, in selling or in marketing financial products. So thank you for your attention and hope to see you in the next session. Thank you.